Hello children, Deshya Vidyashala Samiti Shumoga welcomes you to the first year POC Biology Practicals. Well, have a look at the entrance of our esteemed institution, DVSPU Independent College. Well, children, get set to learn your practicals through video classes because we cannot conduct on account of this corona. Okay, I'm Shruti Ramaswamy, lecturer in the Department of Biology. This practical number three, study of animal specimens. Welcome, welcome to the wonderful world of animal specimens in our biology lab. See, you are getting an opportunity to know about the various species and the coexisters of us. You cannot go and handle them when they are alive. Can you? No. So that's why we have bottled the specimens here with the preservative and each one of the specimen from each of the phylum you are supposed to study. Okay? So these are some specimens which I have just projected before you. See, your question in your lab exam will be the sixth question. The question goes like this, identify the given slide or specimen F in the place of F alphabet it would be placed. So identify the given slide or specimen F giving two reasons. See for identification it would be one mark and for two reasons that you quote we would be awarding you the correct reasons if you have written we would be awarding you one mark. Please don't restrict the reasons only for two. You write five, we select whichever two is apt and correct. Okay? You got it? Identify the given slide or specimen F, giving two reasons. For identification, there will be one mark, and four to five reasons you would have written, and out of them, the correct two would be selected, and one mark would be awarded for it. Well, children, the first specimen that you are supposed to study is amoeba. It belongs to the phylum protozoa, then the class is sarcodina or rhizopoda. Well, amoeba you cannot see through your naked eyes. So it is under the microscope that you are going to observe it. So here I would like to tell you, beyond the ordinary range of unaided vision, there is a wonderful world of microorganisms. Technically, you can call them protozoans too, okay? So we have a slide of this amoeba. Well, under this microscope, we focus it, okay? Handling the microscope, you have learnt it in your very first practicals. So after properly focusing it, we observe how it appears to. See, one is a diagrammatic representation. This is the microscopic view that is visible. See, how about quoting the characteristic features? Amoeba is a freshwater form. That's its habitat, the dwelling place. Well, it is acellular organization, wherein it's a unicellular structure. Then the body shape is irregular. It doesn't have any definite body shape. So it's irregular. Whenever this amoeba needs to move or will have to catch hold of the prey, it protrudes out the projections, the cytoplasmic projections, and they are said to be pseudopodia. Look at the term there. Pseudo, it refers to false. Podos refers to legs. So pseudopodia would be the locomotory structure as well as the structure to feed. Then here, it's an animal cell. So the outermost covering of this cell or the organism will be the cell membrane or plasma membrane or plasma lemma. Synonymously, you can use these terms. So the cell membrane encloses the cytoplasm. It's a eukaryotic cell. So there is presence of the nucleus. Children, are you seeing here? There is a food vacuole. So once the pseudopodia just catches hold of the prey. So it would be phagocytosis if it's a solid substance that is engulfed. Pinocytosis if it's a liquid substance that is engulfed by it. 
whatever it might be. So here the phagosome will be considered to be as the food vacuole, a temporary stomach. Then are you observing here one more structure? It's a contractile vacuole. It's a contractile vacuole. This contractile vacuole is considered to be as osmoregulatory apparatus. In the sense, this contractile vacuole will maintain the water concentration inside the body, the water content inside the body. So it pinches off any extra water content that is present inside the body by moving towards the edge of the cell membrane. This is the structure or the characteristic features that you can quote when you have identified that the given slide is amoeba. Moving to the next one, it's hydra, okay. Here even hydra, we have it in the slide, okay. So the same slide is focused here under the microscope. Okay. So what we speak of this hydra is a cylindrate member. It belongs to the phylum cylindrata. Well, hydra is also a freshwater form. When we look at this structure, see, it has a cylindrical structure and is just like that of a flower. So you say it's a polyp form. Children, you have learnt about the characteristic features in your theory classes. The cylindrates will have two body forms. It is the polyp as well as the medusa. So polyp as well as the medusa. Hydra is a polyp-like structure. They have long tentacles. These tentacles, they are present around the mouth. This mouth is located on the apex of this hypostome. Look at the term there. Hypo is saying below. Stome, stoma, it refers to the opening. So mouth is the opening here. Below this mouth, there is a small bulge and that is said to be hypostome. Well, hydra, it is attached to a substratum. Look at the word there, sub -kelege. strata is layer. Substratum ge, e hydra attached agida. So when the hydra is attached to the substratum, it needs some structure and that structure is a basal disc, okay. So now, here you are seeing there is presence of the testis as well as the ovary. As such, cylindrates, they have a tissue grade of organization. I cannot say it's an organ, I can just say it's an association of the tissues that are present there. Testis as well as the ovaries are available. Hydra, when you look at, it is diploblastic having an outer layer of the cells and inner layer of the cells. Outer layer is said to be as ectodermis, inner one is said to be as endodermis. In between these two, there lies a gelatinous matrix called mesoglia. Anyhow, in the ectodermal layer, they have the stinging cells. They have the stinging cells there. So, gonads may be seen sometime on the body as bulges, that's what is uh, uh, I mean projected over here, testis as well as the ovary. Can you see a small hydra attached to the main body? And that's bud. So it has a capacity to reproduce asexually as well as sexually. Budding is a type of the asexual reproduction. Now children, if the small bud is attached to the main body, parent body, then you can call it a colonial organization. But if it has been detached and only a parental body is available, you can say it's a solitary existence, okay? That was about this hydra. Having seen about this picture, this is what the explanation that you will have to write it. Illi baal important nain gota kushi inda. Neo theoretical part nali yalla phylum the characters in kalth piti dirant hel daga. E structure nord the kudle ne. Adikya anugunu va giron the characters zain ida. Adna neat aga highlight maid bitre ait. Okay? Let us head towards the next one. So it is the specimen fasciola hepatica. This is the specimen here. It is fasciola hepatica. What do you call it commonly? Liver 
fluke. You call it liver fluke. It belongs to the phylum Platyhelminthes. The term itself is indicating here the helminus refers to worms, plati refers to flat. So they are flat worms. Now from platyhelminthes onwards, we get the animals to have a triploblastic organization. Platyhelminthes ninda munda ke baronda ella organism se nida. Adrali triploblastic organization nida. Triplo muru blastos layers of the cells. So they have three layers of the cells in their body wall. Outer ectoderm, middle mesoderm, and innermost endoderm. So in the munda ke bandaga, we can find the organisms. They have the organ and organ system grade of organization. Now we have protozoans know it It's unicellular. So acellular organization and helialtivi. Next bandirvantadu, that is poriferans. Ali kudana, what do we observe and helidre? So it is just aggregation of the cells. Ashte. Next barvantadu, it is the cylindrates. Here you can find they have the tissue grade of the organization. Okay. So ill in the mundake platyhelminthes in the mundake barvantadra liella, they have the organ system grade of the organization. See children, the very word fasciola. Hepatica, yalla, it's a beautiful concept. Naming anvanta the end of New kalthidra binomial nomenclature anta. All the names are Latinized. A Latin term in the derivative agar anta hesar galay ni the. A hesar na lene English meaning thilkon bitter nimge adar da arda baga kalthenge. Fasciola says it is funnel like. Hepatica, whenever we use the term hepatos, it says it is liver. So this. Fasciola hepatica, it just clings or anchors over the liver. It's endoparasitic. We say it is liver fluke and helicarte. What do we call it? We call this liver fluke. Yes, just a minute. Okay, we call this liver fluke. Liver fluke and helicarte. This fluke is the same as the ship in the harbor and the anchor is the same as the device. So, the anchor is the same as the hook. That's the same as the fluke. That's the same as the liver is the same as the liver. The liver is the same as the liver. Look at the body here. It is dorsoventrally flattened. Children, now that they have the organ system grade of organization, they have a bilateral symmetry. You can find their body has different ends. One is the anterior end, the other one is the posterior end. They have a lateral sides here. The upper surface is dorsal, the lower surface is ventral. The body is dorsoventrally compressed. The body is dorsoventrally compressed here. At the apex portion, there is presence of the mouth. Surrounding this will be the oral sucker. It's nothing but a thick musculature. So it is a oral sucker. Look here, below the oral sucker, on the ventral surface, there is an opening for the reproductive organ. So it is gonopore. Look at the word there. Pore is an opening. Gono refers to gonads. Just below that, on the ventral surface itself, there is presence of another sucker and it is said to be acetabulum. It's called acetabulum. Then children, this is the body. On the posterior end of the body, there is presence of this excretory pore. Now, this liver fluke, it is bisexual. Both the male as well as the female reproductive structures, they are present in a single individual itself. They are present on the single individual itself. Okay, now that I said that this liver fluke is an endoparasite, it cannot exist freely and inside anybody else's body. So, when it is dependent upon the host, it needs to have certain adaptations for the existence in somebody else's body. So, what is the adaptation that it has? One, presence of the sucker. Two, you can find they have a cuticle. So, this cuticle 
throughout the body cuticle resists the action of the digestive enzymes of the host body then liver is a slippery organ it has to cling over the liver so it need not have to just to slip out for this reason they have backwardly directed small spine like structures and they are said to be the spinules see even an endoparasite it has to have the adaptation for its survival okay and that was about the liver flu fasciola hepatica come to the next one it is ascaris lumbricoides so commonly we call this to be the round worm of course even this round worm it's an endoparasite it exists in the intestine of the human beings okay the whole body is cylindrical no doubt it is bilaterally symmetrical then you can find it is the triploblastic and it is organ system grade of the organization here one concept what we observe in this is the sexes are separate and the sexual dimorphism is very clearly seen see body is long cylindrical see children females are longer than males here then both the ends they are pointed but the posterior end of the male is curved it's curved but here the posterior end of the female it is blunt okay now in this posterior end there lies a cloaca you know what's a cloaca an opening into which the digestive system opens excretory system opens as well as the reproductive system opens so cloacal aperture is common for copulation ejection as well as excretion so such structure cloaca is present here you see just behind this cloaca there is presence of the pineal setae or copulatory setae there is a lateral line here so this lateral line it perceives the vibrations any changes accordingly which occurs around look here there is presence of the mouth the mouth in case of ascaris is tri lipped more lips the mouth again so that's present at the anterior tip just below one third of the position you find there is presence of the excretory pore in case of the female there is a special opening that's gonopore so that's the opening for the gonads female gonads have a look at this children this is male shorter female lengthier that's why you can identify the male and the female or you can distinguish the male from that of a female looking at the morphological features and that's why you say it is sexual dimorphism wherever the term ends up with ism it says it's a phenomena it's a phenomena next hirudinaria so hirudinaria granulosa the common name for this is indian cattle leech there are various species anyhow what we are studying is about the indian cattle leech here hirudinaria granulosa belongs to the phylum annelida it belongs to the phylum annelida see here liver fluke belongs to the phylum platyhelminthes this is ascaris lumbricoides it belongs to the phylum ask helminthes and here annelida is the next phylum to which this hirudinaria granulosa belongs to or the leech belongs to the very word of the phylum indicates the special feature of this particular group so annulus it says it is a ring that's why the name for this phylum has been given as annelida edos it says is the form see children when we look at this leech we find that the body is elongated they may elongate or contract their body as per their needs because the subcutaneous muscular uh, structure is very very thick 
they have both the circular as well as the longitudinal muscles within them. The whole body, it is having the albuminoid cells which secrete out the albumin to keep the body moist so that the exchange of the gases would occur. In the anterior end, there lies the anterior sucker with mouth in the center. You know, the mouth is having three lips. If you just lift one lip, under each lip, there would be just 100 teeth, that's all. Don't expect the teeth like that of ours, but there would be very sharp edged teeth that would be present there. That's why it's capable of just tearing out the skin of the kip or the buff. Kip is the skin of the cow, buff is the skin of the buffalo. Okay? So then, in the posterior end, there lies another sucker and anus is present over there. Throughout the body, there would be 33 segments, out of which 28 segments lie in the main region, remaining would be in the posterior sucker. When we just observe one segment, in this one segment, there would be five ring-like structures and they are said to be annulus. Well, children, this is the dorsal view and this is the ventral view. See here, in the ventral side of the anterior sucker, there lies the mouth. Okay? On the dorsal side, the first five segments beholds five pairs of the eyes. Then, have a look here. From the sixth to the twenty-second segment, there would be presence of the nephridiopores. Nephridiopores, they are the openings for the excretory organs, nephridia. So these nephridiopores, they would be present from the sixth to the twenty-second segment. Then, look here, on the ventral side itself, in the tenth segment, there is presence of male genital aperture. In the eleventh segment, there is presence of female genital aperture or opening. Well, there would be segmental receptor organs throughout the body. Did you get it? This is the dorsal view and this is the ventral view. That was a well, children, it would be incomplete if I don't tell you some special features regarding this uh, leech. You know what? This leech is sanguivorous. It feeds upon the blood. It feeds upon the blood. You know, when there is a wound, it bleeds for a while and then the blood clots. But this leech very readily keeps uh, sucking the blood. You know how? By injecting an anticoagulant called hirudin. That's why the leech has the name hirudinaria. It belongs to the class hirudinia. Okay? So just see here, a 5 centimeters long leech, when completely fed with the blood, becomes 10 centimeters long. It's all because of the thick musculature it has below its skin. But when it clings over your body and it starts a sucking, you'll feel a cooling effect. You know why? Hirudin brings about the cooling effect. You'll not be knowing, but you would run short with the blood there. So how to get rid of it? You need to just sprinkle the lime powder over it, wherein it burns the leech and it detaches itself. This is how the leech is a successful sanguivore. But one thing very peculiar is that once completely fed the leech is not at all greedy. It stays without food for a span of about eight months. This is really wonderful, isn't it? Yes. That was about the leech here. Next, <clears throat> we are about to study the arthropodan members. Well, in the arthropods, pelamin is one example. This is nothing but the prawn that you're going to study. See, pelamin, prawn, right? So this body is elongated 
and it is bilaterally symmetrical. The body is divided into two regions, cephalothorax. Are you seeing the thick portion here, the anterior portion? It is the fused part of the head and the thorax, and you call this to be cephalothoracic region. One small bent region is there, that's the posterior part of this body, and it is the abdominal region. Can you see here, children, in the mid-dorsal line, there is a serration. That serrated structure <clears throat> is rostrum. At the base of this rostrum, there lies the stalked eye. See here, the cephalothoracic region will bear the compound eye, antennae, antennules, chelate legs, and non-chelate legs. Abdomen bears six segments. So, this is six segments, it bears one pair of the legs each. But in the last sixth segment, so the pair of legs have been modified into uropod and telson. Uropod and telson. You see, uropod, it helps in balancing the body. The very term aura in biology says it is tail. Podos, it says it is leg. How about this telson? Telson, it helps the prawn to have a backward lean. So this is how the prong beautifully, successfully can walk as well as a swim in the water body. <clears throat> this is a labeled diagram. Have a look at it. See here, the cephalothoracic region has a hard covering. It's called carapace. Rostrum, serrated structure. At the base of it is the stalked eye. See here, from the thoracic region, the legs that emerge out, one pair of the legs from each segment, they are called pariopods, walking legs. And from the abdominal region, each of the segment gives rise to one pair of the appendages. They're all called pleopods or swimmerets because they help in swimming. See here, in the sixth segment, one pair of the appendages that were there, they are modified into telson and uropod. Uropod, helping to balance the body, telson, it helps in backward leap of the organism. See, this carapace is so hard. If you are a non-vegetarian, it's an advantage for you. See, when they start cooking the prawn, they usually detach the cephalothoracic region and throw it away. The small, cashew-like, the bent abdominal region, very proteinaceous, that's what they consume. Okay? That was about the spelamin. In this particular species, you can see the prawn, you find it even in the fresh water, as well as in the marine water. <coughs> the next arthropod member to study is the silk moth. Its scientific name is Bombyx mori. You know, this feeds upon the mulberry plant leaves. That's why the name has been given Bombyx mori, because the mulberry plant has the scientific name Morus alba. Okay? This silk moth, when you observe, you can find this is the specimen that we have with us. Okay? See, the head, thorax, and abdomen are the three divisions we find in its body. Head, thorax, and abdomen. <clears throat> the head bears plumose antennae. If it is a male silk moth, antennae is lengthy. Okay? If it is a female silk moth, the antennae is short. It's having a feathery antennae. That's why you call it to be as plumose antennae. In the thoracic region, it would be having three segments. On the ventral side of the thoracic region, you find from each of the thoracic segment arises one pair of the legs. 
there would be two pairs of the wings. The wings also arise from the thoracic region itself. In the moth, which is adult, neither the wing helps in flight nor the legs help in strong walk, but they are present. Abdominal region, <clears throat> this is the region wherein the sexual dimorphism can clearly be seen. In case of the female moth, abdomen is broad. In case of the male moth, the abdomen is narrow. Anyhow, they are nocturnal. Nocturnal in the sense they are active during the night times. Okay? Then, the entire body and the wings, they are covered with microscopic scales. This is how the adult silk moth has the characteristic features. These are various pictures, the enlarged version. Have a look at it. I spoke about the plumos antennae. See children, it's feathery like. That's why we use the term plumos antennae. Can you see the whole body? They have the microscopic scale-like structures. Probably that's for the protection. Now, some peculiar features regarding this. What we saw, the adult moth, this moth will have a very short lifespan. The males, they live for two to three days. The females, they live for four to five days. After the lay of the eggs, the females succumb to death. Males, after the copulation, they die. During this particular span, there would be, the female would be laying nearly 400 to 500 eggs. So these eggs, they get incubated slowly, the young ones hatch out. You call them to be as imago. But while, the egg while in the egg stage, if the small, uh, rather, I'm very sorry, it's not imago, the small structure, when the egg hatches out, that emerges out is the larva. The small larva just keeps on feeding on the mulberry leaf and enlarges in its size. Once the head is got lifted up, that's the point where it starts spinning its cocoon. So inside the cocoon, the larva will metamorphosize and a small structure emerges out with the wings. So that small structure which is in the adult form that emerges out is the imago. Now, it's slightly grows to three to four days it survives and perishes away. From one cocoon, so we can just, if at all, its life history is seized or stopped by the human intervention, from one cocoon, one can just spin out nearly about 200 meters long thread. That's the silk thread, okay? So that was about this, well, the next specimen that you are supposed to study is the honeybee. Honeybee zoologically will be called Apis indica. The body of this honeybee is divisible into head, thorax, and abdomen. Thorax has three segments, prothorax, mesothorax, and metathorax, each bearing jointed legs ventrally. Dorsally, Two pairs of membranous wings are present. In the abdomen, six segments are clearly visible. Three distinct forms can be identified in a colony of honeybee. Children, honeybee, they are the examples for social living. See here, in the colony of the honeybees, they have three groups, queen, drone, and worker. How about this queen? It's all meant for only reproducing. The queen is single, only single, large, and the only fertile female in the colony. Abdomen is long and tapering. Wax glands are absent. Coming to the next one, it is drone. <clears throat> the drones are fertile males but larger than, larger than the workers. But it is smaller than the queen. The eyes of the drones, they are very large. Wax glands are absent. Worker. 
They are small, sterile females. Abdominal segments bear the wax glands. See here, they go, they are workers, they collect the nectar, so they have the wax glands. Sting is present at the end of the last abdominal segment. See, here is a picture which is depicting it. The thoracic legs, they bear the pollen collecting sacs. Okay, the thoracic legs, they bear the pollen collecting sacs there. Okay, the sting which is present is in the abdominal region, a venomous sac, then a retractor muscle and a stinger. So, if you have got a honey bee sting, so bite, it is nothing but the female worker who has stung you. Okay, so that's it about the honey bees. Come to the next one. So, it is Pila globosa. Commonly, we call this to be apple snail. <clears throat> See, this is a molluscan member. The three specimens previously what you studied, they belong to arthropoda. Arthros refers to jointed, podos refers to the legs. Now, we are studying about the mollusca. The very word mollus, it refers to soft. See, nature is so beautiful. Such a soft bodied molluscan member is gifted with a hard shell surrounding its body. So, though the body of the mollusks, they are very soft, they have a hard protective covering over their body and that is the shell. The specimen that you are supposed to study here, it's the apple snail or Pila globosa. See, this Pila globosa is amphibious in its nature. It lives both on the land and in the water. So, you can exemplify it to be as amphibious mollusk. This animal resides within the hard shell. The shell is made up of only one piece. Okay? Then the animal is spirally coiled inside the shell. There is a wide opening of the shell. It remains closed by an operculum. Children, wherever you come across the word operculum in biology, it says it's a lid or a closure. The body of the animal has three regions, head, ventral foot, and dorsal visceral mass. When I say the word viscera, it says it is very soft. On the dorsal side, there is a visceral mass. So, throughout the body, on its dorsal side, there is presence of a thin fold of the skin and it is said to be the mantle. This mantle is responsible for the formation of the shell. It also helps in the respiration. In between the body and the mantle, there is a small space and that is what is said to be as mantle cavity into which there would be the excretory products that would be just, I mean, let out into. The entire body may have the siphon within it like other mollusks do have. This particular animal, it lives in shallow fresh water and it moves, I can use the word creeps with the help of its food. That's Pila globosa. Well, this is a beautiful animal, star-like. You not only see the stars in the sky, but you can also see the stars in the sea. So such star-like structures in the sea, they are said to be the star fishes. It's asterius rubens or astropectin that are visible as species there. They are exclusively marine forms. One special feature, what we observe is, from the platyhelminthus till the mollusks, we have seen the animals, they are all bilaterally symmetrical. But now, when we look at this echinoderms, there's a 
echinodermata phylum to which the starfish belongs to. When we look at the echinoderms, they are radially symmetrical adults, but in the larval stages, they are bilaterally symmetrical. That's why they have not placed them under cylindrator, rather they have placed them separately. So here you find the adults are radially symmetrical. There is a central disc from which the radiating arms are seen. There are five. So we can say the body is pentamerous. We say the body is pentamerous because it might be five or multiples of the five that the body parts can be divided into. One of the surfaces is oral surface. To be on the safer side, we do not say dorsal and ventral. Here we use the term oral surface because mouth is located there. The surface opposite to this will be called aboral surface. It's called aboral surface. Okay? So mouth is located in the oral surface. In the aboral surface, there is the anus that is present. Now, see here at the base of any of the two arms, there is presence of a madriporite in the aboral surface. Children, each of the arms here at its tip will have one eye and then there will be a pair of the tentacles. When the animal is alive, the eye will be red in its color. Are you seeing something centrally here? So this is ambulacral groove. On either side of it, you can find some bead-like structures. They are said to be the tube feet. Okay? So the ambulacral grooves, they radiate from mouth to arms. Look at the term, ambulacral grooves. When I use the term groove, it's a depression. Ambu, it says it is ambulation, ambulance. It's something for movement. So they have special organs called the Q feet. What's the special feature in these organisms? It's the presence of water vascular system. Because of this water vascular system, there would be a hydraulic pressure type of the movement that is being exhibited. Are you seeing the starfishes here? The surface is aboral. On the lower side is the oral surface. These starfishes, they are all exhibiting the locomotion and some among them, they are feeding. The whole arms will just catch hold of the prey and crush it and feed it into the mouth. That's the beautiful star of the sea. That's a starfish. Well, children, that was it about the invertebrates. What next?